please join me in welcoming Commissioner Kyle Janet. Thank you, sir. Very nice to have you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. you being here. Good morning. Dr. Janet, good morning. Thank good, you for being here. Good morning. Is my mic on? It is. Very nice to see you. Remotely. Good morning. Appreciate you being here. So tomorrow is a big day. It is a big day. Tomorrow is the day when the Women's Health Program mm -hmm. converts. Can you tell us uh, up to the minute where we are, please? Um, I'm glad we're starting with this one. We're going to be doing a press are conference. Are you surprised? <laughs> not, not terribly. We're going, to, yeah. we're going to hold a press conference here in a couple hours with Governor Perry up in, uh, in Georgetown. And um, because we've had dueling court battles, we're in federal court, we're in state courts, we've got three big lawsuits going on, one of, of which the state filed against Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. Um, the others were filed against Health and Human Services Commission. It gets a little bit confusing to folks. Are we in or are we out? Uh, tomorrow is the day in which we will be ready to launch Texas Women's Health Program. However, because we have this system already in place for the Medicaid Women's Health Program, <clears throat> with the federal funding that it flows from it, we would like to continue that system. We've asked CMS if we could continue that system and, and, and realize the federal yeah. dollars that come with that. The answer has been... Uh, fairly guarded, only in that the director for Medicaid has told me that they will not, they cannot extend the waiver past the end of the year, yeah. <clears throat> and that we need at least 30 days to start to notify, as we sometimes say, clients. I call them patients yeah. to notify them of the wind down of the system. We've right. we've started some of that, but it was fairly clear in my discussion with her that we would be well underway and completed with that by December one. So on the one hand, I have this signal from the feds that we may be okay to continue with the Medicaid Women's Health Program through the end of the year. On the other hand, I have to be ready tomorrow with the new program right. because we don't know what the courts are going to say. We could look up tomorrow or the next day and realize that the feds just simply didn't give us notice. They're just not going to fund it. This is in flux. Still in flux. It is very much in flux. Right. My job is to make sure that we've got an adequate network yep. that complies with the state law that also complies with court orders, mm -hmm. but we need an adequate network because there's 115 to 150,000 women out there who need these services and will qualify for these services. Is it too simple-minded of me to say that the pivot point still appears to be Planned Parenthood? I, they're, the, they're the biggest rallying cry for one side or the other. Yeah. That, 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 is, that is not simple-minded. They are sort of a pivot point. but. At the outset, the legislature determined that they didn't want state funds to go to abortion providers or their affiliates. Well, it is so the law that no state funds can go to pay for that, abortions. For abortions. That That's is correct. absolutely true. That's correct. Right. It's, not, it's not the law they can't go to their affiliates, right? To, to non-abortion providing clinics. It is now the law. Now the law. But, yes. it, but it has not been the law. But it had not been the law. It actually has been the law because it was in a statute that was passed previously, but we yeah. never really got around to defining what affiliates mean. Okay. And so, um, your definition the, the of affiliates, or the definition of the affiliates under the law currently, is what? Um, it is anyone who, by contract, and I'd refer you directly to the language because we yeah. need to be very specific in that language. Right. Who uh, performs, promotes um, abortions? And then there's a, the, the, the affiliate language is very specific because right. it means how you are arranged contractually. And I'll, let me give you a quick example. Yeah. In the rules that were, in play, that were proposed when I took this job, there was um, a provision in there that said that if you were in any way under a contractual arrangement with someone who provides abortion, who right. performs abortions, then you could not be a member of the Texas Women's Health Program. Even if uh, you yourself did not provide abortions in that facility. Even if you yourself did right. not. And that was problematic. What uh, One of the uh, comments from, um, I don't know if it came from the medical schools or from Texas Medical Association, but one of the comments was, what about faculty on medical schools? Right. They teach residents how to perform these procedures, yeah. which is a legal procedure. They, they, they teach them how to do that, but now they're on the faculty and they're in a group practice plan. Does that taint the entire faculty? Yeah. Uh, that brings to mind other medical practices where you may have a large group practice, which is much more common nowadays. Large group practice where one provider may do it, another provider may not, and so then you take that one who does not perform abortions and say, are we gonna let you in a Texas Women's Health Program? Right. 
the rules that I changed made that very clear that part of a group practice does not count as an affiliate. We don't look at hospitals where um, elective abortions occur or, or performed, but it's in the instance of a severe fetal abnormality in which the fetus has no chance of survival, right. even with heroic measures outside the womb. But for purposes sure. under the law now, the non-abortion providing clinics that operated under the Planned Parenthood banner would be, as we know, are disqualified. It, it, that, that's correct, as, as I think they're legally structured right. now. There, there seems to be some dispute about whether this was something that the legislature, the, the so-called poison pill question, you know, that if, the, if Planned Parenthood is, is, is made to remain by the courts in the program, that you're going to scrap the program. That, uh, that, that was at least, and I assume that is still the policy of the state right it, now. Is that it correct? Is, it is the, the so-called poison pill language or the non severability right. clause, which just says that if the courts undo the intent of the state action, which right. is not to provide funding to affiliates of abortion providers, right. then the whole thing collapses. I want to clarify something on that, though. I, I have heard you say and heard the governor say that this is basically the will of the legislature, that the, <coughs> the so-called poison pill that you're describing would be essentially just the state following the will of the legislature. I thought that that attempt by uh, Senator Duell to put that into law did not actually pass. It's, so it's, how is that the will not, of the legislature? Yeah, it, it, it's, not, it's not that the non-severability is necessarily the will of the legislature, although that, that was talked about. You're yeah. correct. However, if the courts say we find that what you're doing is unconstitutional or contrary to other state statute or federal statute, right. then we're going to say that you have to provide funding, you have to include in your program those providers who are affiliates of those who provide abortions, um, then it, it negates the intent of the legislation itself, in which case there's no point in having that program. So that if is still your forced, policy going forward. That is still the policy. That, that, that's what will happen. If we are forced by the courts yeah. to provide uh, funding to those affiliates, then it negates the, the effect of the statute to begin with, and so there's no point in having right. that program. You might as well go back to the Medicaid women's the, the advocates for Planned Parenthood have made a point of making the point I'm about to make. I want to give you the opportunity to respond to it directly that, you know, uh, uh, there were something like 48,000 women who were receiving uh, uh, health services, non-abortion health services at clinics at which abortions were not provided, were part of the program previously, who will no longer be part of the program. They say what the state is fixing to do is to toss those people to the curb, basically. They'll no longer be able to get health services. What I know the state has said is we are adding providers to the program and that we're going to basically make good on our promise to provide health to those women. But what they'll say back is those providers say they don't have the capacity to actually take on the additional patients. Many of the procedures that were performed at the previous providers in the program are not available at the new providers, they say. What about that? Um, my job is to make sure we've got an adequate number of providers yeah. and those adequate providers are spread in a good geographical distribution so yeah. that we don't have holes of coverage you know, throughout the state and then to make sure that those providers have the actual capacity. So, so far we've got climbing from 3,000 providers across the state willing to participate in the program. Um, and now we go back and we start to gauge capacity. So yeah. I, don't, I, I don't have the number for capacity yet, although we're talking to them. And it's not because we haven't been trying, but you've got to remember under the old rules, we had a lot of providers that were afraid. They just said, I, it just sounds like I'm not sure I can be a provider legally and therefore I'm not even going to try. Right, but Dr. Janik, again, there have been public testimony by some of the people who run these new providers that they say we just don't have the capacity to take on the additional patients that will be required under the new pr program. What about that? And, and, well, because that, that individual who testifies may not have the capacity, but the number, the question is what are your total numbers? How many right. providers do you have in the system and what is their total How long capacity? will it take the program as, as reconstituted to have an adequate number of providers to make up for those providers lost? We're going to ask, as I said, because we just finished out those rules, we're now yeah. getting feedback from a lot of the docs that are saying, yes, now I want to be a provider, I want to participate in the program. We've got TMHP, our Medicaid contracting um, administrator, is making phone calls to the docs in the program saying, would you continue in Texas uh, women's health program if, and here are the provisions. So first, first job is to make sure that everyone understands what the rules now are so that we're not chasing providers off. Right. Second job is to go to them and say, we're going to make this seamless. We want this to be easily understood by your office, but certainly by your patients as well, so that your patients will see a seamless transition from one to the other. They'll continue on with you, and the, the reimbursement rates will be similar 
practically the same. So once we get those docs signed up, then we say, okay, now how many do you think you might be able to take in your area? It takes a while to make those calls engage that right. capacity. Let me take you back to the legislature, uh, to the session. You obviously were no longer a member of the legislature, though you served in the legislature. You didn't have the job that you have currently. But when the discussion was being uh, uh, conducted in the session last time to remove Planned Parenthood, to cut family, I think the ultimate cut to family planning funding was two-thirds, I think, uh, in the last session. Um, was this a budget issue, or was this what Newt Gingrich once referred to as social engineering on the part of the legislature, to remove Planned Parenthood? You'd have to ask the folks that what, what, What's your view of why the state is proceeding with this? What, what is the motivation or the rationale for proceeding with this, and with the cuts to family plan? Motivation of the commission is to comply with state law, and I'm not right. trying to be coy with you. What so I'm you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't want to, you don't want to make, it, uh, make a, a comment or, or, or make an observation about why you, what you think the rationale was. You've got enough folks that come to this stage that are the policymakers, and they can comment. Well, on let that. me ask the question a different way. The Legislative Budget Board, uh, you know the LBB well, having sure. served 13 years in the legislature, made a, a point of saying during the last session when there was legislation to cut family planning that the, the cuts to family planning might save X amount of money but that the cost of the state would likely increase. We're already at a place where the state, 50% of the births in the state are Medicaid births. That, number, that percentage is surely going to increase if the number of unwanted pregnancies goes up. The assumption has always been if you cut family planning funding, the ultimate cost of the state might actually go in the wrong direction. I asked the governor about this a couple weeks ago, and his response was to trash the LBB. Would you like to join him in trashing the LBB as unreliable? <laughs> or do you have a different point of view about that? Um. No, I don't want to trash the LBB. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, you're, you're welcome. Um, what's your What's your first, point of view about first, that? Yeah, yeah, let me make Let me make the distinction between those programs that were funded that were cut, but those programs that were funded through Department of State Health Services right. under Title Ten, yeah. and those were not part of the Medicaid Women's Health Program. Um, those uh, Those funds were cut, and I don't know. I don't know the historical reason for that. I don't know who, you know, if that was just a pure budget reason or not. Uh, reason or not. You'd have to have Sam. However, um, what we're trying to do in the Texas Women's Health Program is to restore the funding to as many of the women that need those services, and I'll, I'll work on the high end of the estimate, yeah. 150,000 women who need those services, depend on them as part of the waiver that we've asked the federal government to continue with. Yep. Um, they've said no because we, the, the state restricted the, the scope of the providers that can participate. Um, it does save money in the long term for Medicaid or for the state in general. Um, and what we're trying to do with Texas Women's Health Program is to restore the funding so we can provide birth control and sterilization, tubal ligation, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, that, will, that will save money, and that'll, that'll be borne out in our So you think contrary to the program. reports that it will actually cost money, your position is it will ultimately it save It will money. initially cost money, but right. you've got to remember, because the program has been in place, we're currently realized savings right. from the birth control that was given out to people in the past, yeah. right? So we're currently realizing those savings. Now when you look at a new program, on the right. books it's going to look like an initial cost, although we'll still be realizing the savings that's been taking place in the past, but it'll be an initial cost to that program and then within two to three years the, 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 it'll flip and we'll be saving more money than we'll be spending with the program. All right. Let me ask you a broader question about the state of health policy in Texas and the uninsured. Uh, you know that the U.S. Census Bureau some six weeks ago put out a report that said that Texas now has 5.8 uh, uh, million uninsured citizens, 23 percent of our population, which makes us first among the states in the percentage of our citizens uninsured. You gave an interview to Emily Ramshaw of the Tribune at the Texas Tribune Festival in which you basically said, I don't believe those statistics. This is the U.S. Census Bureau, not public policy polling. It's a little hard to argue that the polls are skewed when the numbers are coming from the Census Bureau, Dr. Right. Janik, don't you think? Um, no, their numbers are accurate for the question that they ask. So you think they asked the, the wrong question? The question. No, I, don't, I think they, did, they asked a question. A not question. The, it's not the wrong question. Right. It's a question. Yeah. And here's the issue. If you go out now today and you and you go knock on doors as the Census Bureau does and yeah. do it by letter and so forth, do you have insurance? A lot of folks will say no. Doesn't mean they won't have insurance next week. Doesn't mean they will have insurance next week. It could be years before they have insurance again. Right. It's a snapshot. Yeah. My point Any with survey her, like that would point, be a snapshot. My, that's right. Yeah. And my point, my point with her, unless you get a little bit deeper and say, did you have it? Are you between jobs? Do you have a job on the horizon that may offer insurance? You know, some of those sorts of things right. that don't really fit the, the reason for the census to begin with. However, uh, inartfully worded with her, is, is not that I 
don't believe those numbers, but I need to know the reason for those numbers, and here's why. Yeah. If you take, and I'll be careful, I'm always careful with analogies because they can get you in trouble. Somebody else will pick up with it and run too far, and then all of a sudden you're That's okay. You're, there are no reporters here. You just go ahead and say whatever you want. <laughs> um, there's, there's, two, there's two systems at work to make sure that people get health care coverage that they need, and that's just discounting those few people who can just pay out of pocket for yeah. it. Okay. The first system is one of insurance, and insurance is like a parachute. You know, if I work up on a, on a high-rise building and, 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 and it, I'm worried about falling off, well, I've got a parachute, and it's me. It's my parachute. If I fall off, it catches me. But there is another system that we tend to forget, and that is the system of safety net hospitals around the state, through local hospital districts, through disproportionate share hospital funding, right. through the historical UPL funding, and now the uncompensated care model. But it's a safety net system so that there is some place for somebody to go, and they're going to get care. Traditionally, historically, it has been most evident in two places. The public hospitals that are created, funded through taxes, uh, property taxes, but also through our state-supported medical schools. So where I'm going with this is just to say that in addition to that parachute, you also need a safety net at the, at the bottom. Because if you didn't catch that one person working on the high rise and they don't have the parachute, you need some place for them to fall. What I said to Ms. Ramshaw, and I'm glad for the chance to clarify it, was when somebody says, I don't have insurance, it is a different story than saying, I don't have any place to go. Right. I have no place to go. But Dr. Dr. Want, Janik, by I that, I just by, want to shore yeah. up that model. But too. Dr. Janik, but by that, by that extension of that, you could say that the percentage of uninsured in the state is zero, because anybody can walk into an emergency room and get care. I mean, that's, where is no. the appropriate calibration between anybody can go to an emergency room and get care and 5.8 million don't have insurance? I mean, right. How are we supposed to look at the problem of people not having no, a place no, to number, go? Number one yeah. is that those folks who don't have insurance typically live in the larger metropolitan area just because that's, that's where the numbers are, but there's a great number of people percentage-wise who live in rural areas and don't have access to those public hospital districts, and I fully appreciate that. Right. It's not, I'm not trying to play the words games here to figure yeah. out, you know, are we completely unsure, are we completely right. uninsured, I, I don't care. My job as Commissioner of Health and Human Services is to see that, number one, we've got a safety net yep. through those public hospitals and right. the private hospitals who are part of that, very important part of that safety net. Right. Bigger, usually bigger than the public hospitals themselves, yeah. but to make sure there's some place for them to go. And, and if I could just throw one more piece yeah. in here. For a hundred years, we've had a tradition in this state where people who knew they couldn't, didn't have some place to go to get health care, knew that they could go to local state-supported medical schools. Yeah. And, and we've positioned those medical schools now where the population is. Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, Fort Worth, Galveston, yeah. soon to be probably in the Valley, perhaps here in Austin, Amarillo, uh, excuse me, uh, Lubbock, El Paso. Yeah. That's where the populations are centered. And, and one of the things that I'd like to see us do is shore up those medical schools for decades now, a couple of decades. Legislature has told the medical schools, yeah, we can't really give you more money. The medical schools have to go out and find private pay insurance. Right. And so I think that they're an important part of the safety net, and there's a twofer in there. Number one, adequately funding them. And if we can find a way to take that straight general revenue, about a billion dollars a year that goes to the medical schools, and use that as sort of a Medicaid supplement for the Medicaid and uncompensated care that they do, much as we do in disproportionate share hospital programs. Yeah. Now we've turned that into a federal match, and we've bolstered, number one, we've bolstered the um, financing for the medical school to provide that kind of care. Yeah. And some of that will spill over to the uncompensated care as well. But also importantly, we've incentivized the medical schools to get out there. You help us uh, create the next generation of doctors. You are, you are practically begging me to ask you if you're voting for Proposition 1. <laughs> are you? If I were going to beg you to ask me, then I would give you an answer. And I'm not gonna so you, but, 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 but it sounds like you're, 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 you're doing Kirk Watson's dirty work for him. You say, it sounds to me like you're making a case for the medical school. I'm making a case for the medical schools. 
Schools, it, plural. It, it, that's yeah, the but the one that's on the ballot is this one. Are you voting for this one? I am the executive commissioner of Health and Human Services for the state of Texas. But you are a I'm voter not first and I'm foremost. Not You're not going to say. There's that's nothing why we I have can do. Secret ballot. Jaws Good of try. life would not get it out Good of you. Good try. Right. This is why we have secret ballots. Uh, that, 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 that's but, but that's a, exactly right. I am, I am a fan of the medical schools, and especially the medical schools sticking to that mission. They have three missions. The yep. education, research, and patient care. And I want to see that to the extent that my office can affect this, I want to see that more of their general revenue, to the extent they're willing, I'm not yeah. talking about trying to force them, to the extent that they're willing, is some of that general revenue, which is just straight dollars, gets moved into a Medicaid match scenario, whether it's through the 1115 waiver, yeah. transformation waiver, or through a Medicaid supplement match. Right. I actually discussed this very briefly with uh, the folks at CMS, and, and there was no big pushback, and I said, hmm. I'm not talking about GME funding, graduate medical education yeah. funding, just here's some money for residents, don't do that. It is about taking care of Medicaid patients right. and to some extent spill. Let me come back to the uninsured question for one second before we get into Medicaid. So after the 5.8 million, uh, pardon me, million citizens uninsured number came out, the former state demographer and former U.S. Census Bureau uh, uh, director, Steve Murdoch, who's now at Rice University, and his colleague Michael Klein put out a report that said that if the state embraced, I assume the federal expansion of Medicaid specifically, uh, or the opportunity to expand Medicaid by the Affordable Care Act, but other key aspects of federal health reform, that Texas could insure 3 million of those 5.8 million uninsured citizens by 2014. I know that you and the governor and other people in state leadership have a problem with the expansion of Medicaid, which we'll get to in a second, but those are some pretty big numbers. And the idea that you could insure potentially more than half, whatever you believe the ultimate number is, that you could insure on a percentage basis more than half of the uninsured people in Texas just in a couple of years by embracing aspects of fair health reform. It's a hard thing to look at and go, no, we decline. What, what, what do you say about that? Um, number one, I think we need to do a better job with the resources we've got. And I, I, will, I will only hit this subject this one more time, and I won't uh, take up too much of no, that's fine. precious time. Go but, but if you look at the medical schools, again, if you look at what a medical school is, it's doctors, nurses, physical therapists, you got specialists of all stripes, yep. you've got hospitals affiliated with them. If you treat them as their own managed care organization, you treat them as their own network, yep. and now you've taken what historically was straight general revenue, but you convert that into a managed care plan and say, some folks will choose to go to the, this hospital, some yeah. will go to this hospital or this network, some folks will choose to go to the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston network yep. because of their reach and their location and their ability to get out in the community and open clinics and do that sort of thing. That, that is a, it's not just a safety net, now they actually do become an insurer. So what I'm telling you, Mr. Smith, is we can do a better job with the existing resources before we, before we get too tied up into spending more resources right. on. Now, some of this needs, I don't think that what I'm talking about with the medical schools needs a waiver, but I know you, there'll be much discussion there, about yeah. block grants. True. Um, it's not that, the, that I'm in some fight with the federal government or CMS. CMS you may be, you may be the only one in the state who isn't. CMS is only CMS is often constrained by federal law. Right. And it's, it's not their fault. They they say we can we can give you a waiver for this and for that. We can only push it so far. But here's the thing: if they would let us have more flexibility through statute or through yeah. waiver, more flexibility, we might be able to design a system that says utilizing the medical schools, we can expand to some of those right. populations. I've talked with the governor about this, and I said, just give me some latitude. I want to I go explore some different things that we might be able to if do. If we can get more flexibility, and that might actually... If we get more flexibility, yeah. then right. I think we could create a network that would be just terrific. You, you, you made a point a moment ago, I want to come to Medicaid in a second, but you made a point that said, well, you know, there's, there's more we could be doing with existing resources. We have had a problem of a high percentage of our citizens uninsured. This is not a Rick, let's be honest, this is not a Rick Perry administration problem. It goes back to George Bush, it goes back to Ann Richards. We've had a problem of having a disproportionately high percentage of our citizens uninsured for quite some time. Why haven't we, if, if we can do more with the current system than we're doing, why haven't we done it? I mean, the, the, I think the logical question to ask is, we know what people don't like. They've been very clear about what they don't like. Tell me what you do like, tell me what you think will work, and tell me why you haven't done it if you think it'll work so far. That is a question for the policymakers. You could go back to me as a lawmaker and say, why didn't you do it? Actually, some of the things I'm talking about with the medical schools I actually tried to do um, yeah. when I was a lawmaker. I was just unsuccessful in getting my message across. Um, I, I, I don't have the answer as to why it's not been as done. done why it's not been a priority? Why there haven't been some of the fixes that people say? 
you know, well, we don't need to do a, the Affordable Care Act or don't need to expand Medicaid because there are all these things we can do here. Well, tell us what they are. Yeah. What, what are um, they? And why haven't you done them? Here's one that the legislature has done, yeah. and that is the current Medicaid Women's Health Program. Right. Right. And what that, because the the uh, single female who did not have kids and was not pregnant currently, based on poverty level, was not eligible above a certain very low poverty level for Medicaid. Um, the state went to the CMS and said, we'd like a waiver, we'd like to provide. And the waiver, you need a waiver because you're gonna tell the federal government, we wanna provide limited services, yep. limited but important services, to a limited population. Rather than we wanna expand Medicaid for everything for all women who fit under this poverty level. So the state went to the CMS and said, we'd like to do this for women under 185% of federal poverty level for family planning and other services and some basic women's health services, screening for cancer and, and so forth. Um, and we'd like to do that for a five-year waiver period, which is typical for the time period. And, and the federal government said yes. That kind of innovation, now that launches back in the whole other issue of now, yeah, but now you're gonna undo that for yeah. other policy reasons that the legislature has visited, visited and spoken on. I mean, yeah. I'm constrained by what the law tells me to, to do. Um, but but when you start to think about how Texas is different, yeah. where are the folks who need help, where they live, what are the, what's their situation, is it, is it, do we have so many people that are temporarily uninsured, or yeah. is it the, just the you know, general climate of you know, better weather and glorious place to live, folks come here and that attracts more folks with, with healthcare needs or disabilities? I, I don't know yet, but we have to design the system that fits for us. So, so to that point, Texas is different and Texas needs to have the ability to design a system that works for Texas. Yes. That is the reason that the pushback on federal expansion of Medicaid has come from the state. That we, it's not that we don't want the federal dollars, we're, we like federal money, we just don't like federal strings and we don't like the finite nature of that money so that if we accept it and we incorporate it into our plans, at a certain point, that money's not going to be there, and we're going to be stuck with the check. Is that is that the way the problem? And it's not just correct, and it's yeah. not just Texas. It's other states to get together and say, we know you're trying to lure us in with this expansion for right. three years. It's free money, but then we'll have to spend 10 percent after that. And you know, Medicaid is almost like it's. Don't want anybody to misinterpret my analogy, please. But but it's almost like a coupon. You got to spend. 40 cents to get 60 cents back. Right. In some cases, you gotta spend 10 cents to get 90 cents back. Some, in some cases, you know. You gotta spend money. In some, some cases, cases, that's a good deal. In, in many cases, that's a good deal, but you yeah. gotta spend that money, and it's a priority for the legislature to say, here's, we, we have to stop the spending someplace on health care because we need to spend, spend money on education and other important needs. Those are policy decisions that they're gonna right. make. I, I think the issue to go back to Medicaid expansion is quite simply that the states are banding together saying, we don't want to do this. Can you not give us broad flexibility, not just CMS giving us a waiver, which is a permission slip, right. but broad f flexibility, perhaps set in federal statute, and let us design a system that works. What, what you just described, though, the 10 percent, you know, pay 10 cents to get back 90 or pay 40 to get 60, you make it sound like a referendum when it's actually a choice. It's not that deal or not that deal. It's that deal versus whatever we decide to do back here. My question is, if we don't take the federal deal, what are we prepared to do and what are we going to have to spend here as, a, as an A, B, right? If that's A, right. what's B? Right. B is, one of the things of B, parts of B, is the 1115 transformation waiver. Yeah. A year ago, my predecessor went to CMS and said, We'd like, we'd like some broad flexibility with, to, um, it, it, it revolved around upper payment limit uh, payments to hospitals, which yeah. is the difference between what Medicare pays and what Medicaid pays. It gets fairly wonkish pretty fast, um, but the issue I is this. I think in this crowd that's fine. But, so yeah, right, right. Yeah. Um, but the issue is this, because we were going to a managed care um, framework for Medicaid statewide, UPL couldn't fit in that. And so we had to go to the feds and say, okay, we'd like to realize some of those historic dollars for our upper payment limit, and we'd like to uh, sort of change the delivery model. And the feds said, okay, so we'll give you uncompensated care funds, which over the next five years is gonna be about 17, 17 billion, mm -hmm. a little over 17 billion, and so-called DISRIP 
dis, uh, delivery system reform incentive payments. Um, and that's about just close to 12 billion. And so when you take those dollars together, now the public hospitals, which served as a safety net, can be plan B. They can say, we've been limited by the tax dollars that we've got, but now you're giving us a lot more right. money to partner up with our private hospitals uh, uh, in our various regions, and now we can go out, we can do clinics, we can transform, right. I hate to overuse so you, you, that you word. Think, so you deliver. think there are other options? There are other options, right. yes. 1115 waiver is an important part of that. Two, two quick ones on this before I know we're told we have to go to questions. So we're gonna have an election next Tuesday, you've heard? I've heard. Uh, if the president is reelected, the assumption is that it's gonna be harder for Congress to unwind the Affordable Care Act, because obviously the president's not gonna take the lead in doing that. Congress may be divided again as it is now. The votes may not be there. We may just have to go on with the decision that the Supreme Court made that this is gonna be the law of the land. What does Texas do in that case, and what does Texas do if Governor Romney wins next Tuesday? What, what, what are the, the scenarios? I'm certain that you've done some planning for that. So um, give us a sense of what, what you're thinking on Right, this. okay. Um, if in, in, I, the Affordable Care Act is the law of the land. We're operating under the assumption that it is and will continue to be the law of the land. So there are many, many things that have to take place, not the least of which is the federal government in the Affordable Care Act has changed the accountability for, regi for el uh, eligibility of patients in Medicaid. They've gone to something called the Modified Adjusted Gross Income, uh, the MAGI, if you will. And, and that changes. Our computer is not set up to do the modified adjusted gross income model, but rather something based on households, and the feds have a different definition of a household. It sounds like a few computer tweaks. It's not. It's a vastly different way to identify who is eligible for Medicaid under federal law. Right. So we're currently undertaking those processes to make sure that we're compliant with the Affordable Care Act. We've had many discussions with CMS to say we need a little more guidance. We hate to go spend a bunch of money and do things only to find out it's not really what you had in mind. We know what the law says, but CMS has the power to put some regulations in place. Yeah. So we're working with our friends at CMS to see if we can sort of figure out what some of those things are going to be. And we're not alone. Other states are in the same, uh, in the same dilemma. Um, also, there's the, the, um, the, the question of all those folks, because their individual mandate was held to be constitutional, you got a bunch of people who now have to go get insurance. About, it's, it's estimated that maybe 12% of the folks who are eligible for Medicaid are not enrolled. Well, okay, so we think that maybe half of those, 6% of the Medicaid population will increase. They will go, now go on to the eligibility and enrolled roles, yep. and so we'll have an influx of Medicaid patients. We're getting ready for those. Yep. We're putting those estimates into our legislative appropriations request. Slight increase in caseload for 2013, um, uh, excuse me, for 2014, and then a larger increase for fiscal year 20. So it sounds like you're actually preparing for an Obama victory. You've, oh, been, you've been talking to I Nate Silver? Please, let's don't, I'm not preparing for any victory. I, I, the law of the land is in front well, what of me. Happen, what happens if Governor Romney wins? Has, how does this unwind? Or what do you stop doing? What do you start doing right, if Governor right, Romney wins? Right now, everything that we're doing is preparing. It, it, so it, November 7th, a, Governor nothing, Romney wins on November 6th. On November 7th, stop. Absolutely not, because it's still the preparing mode. I may have wasted some of my time, but that's my job, is to get this done. And some of the staff's time of preparing for things that may be changed. but. We have to plan for the long haul, and we can't look towards the next election cycle and what may or may not happen. Now, if there's a change in the administration, change in the White House, change yep. in Congress, and they come and say, okay, time out, we'll, we'll take a hard look at block grants, um, then, we'll, then we will pivot, and then we will start to develop a plan. All right, Janet, you asked for more flexibility. You're given the ultimate flexibility. What are you going to do? That will be a different question for right. a few weeks from now, or maybe it won't be. You know, Dr. Janik, that a number of the big counties in Texas, regardless of what the state does on the federal expansion of Medicaid, would like to figure out how they can work together to wire around you yeah. and go that way themselves. Will the state try to erect a barrier to that if that happens? They would need a legislative change to do that. They'd have to talk to the legislature and figure out whether that they're, they're amenable to going on. Your going along. Uh, uh, folks will not have a policy position on whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for the counties to do. No, my job is to advise the legislature and to advise the governor's office. What will you, advi what will you advise them on? Um, my, my advice would be that it depends on what they're going to get in exchange for that, for that going along. Are they going to expand Medicaid, but it's going to be with the current services, and does it then mean that a patient, if let's say 
a particular county chose to go that direction. And they contracted directly with CMS and said, okay, we're going to be a Medicaid provider in this county. Does that mean that that contract that they've signed now carries over? If you do it in one county and that patient is somewhere else in another state. Right. I don't know the answers to all that, but my advice is they need to figure those things out. Before they do, Again, yeah. before they can do that, they're going to need legislative approval. And, I, and my advice is not so much on good idea, bad idea. It's on here's the things you need to think about. Okay, one last, I promise, last one quick. The, the supposed 4.7 or $4.8 billion that the state is going to have to come back and put in to pay right. the out months on, the, on Medicaid that they did a 17 or 18 month budget for a 24 month biennium. The theory has always been that on day one they're going to have to pass, not for the first time, a supplemental appropriations bill to go ahead and make good that amount. Uh, is it true that that is the amount as of today, as far as you know, that it's four, the number I keep hearing is 4.8. In fact, Chairman Pitt said a couple weeks ago at Mary Scott Neighbors Conference that he understood that it was in fact still 4.8. Part B is uh, Dr. Schwartner, soon to be Senator Schwartner, told me the other day that as he understands that there's a possibility that the economy has recovered to such a degree that that money may be able to come out of current revenue as opposed to having to pull it out of the rainy day fund. So can you comment on A, is the amount really 4.8, and B, do you, are you understanding that there's a conversation about that money coming out of current revenue as opposed to going into the rainy day fund to pull it out? Um, First thing, that is the right number, but it's not for the purpose that you hypothesize. Uh, uh, educate me. Is the $4.7 billion yeah. is for this current biennium right. to carry us into the next legislative session. Doesn't right. have anything to do with the, with, it's the shortfall going in. That we right, but it's a supplemental appropriations uh, uh, that's yeah. going to have to be passed. Right, right? Yes. That, is, that, is, that is to get us to the additional caseloads that we had. Granted. That is money Granted. that's already been spent. Yeah. But it's not for those months that the legislature chose not to fund last time. That, the, that number will become, um, I, I think that number will be closer to $11.3 billion. I think that number will be closer to 11.3. What, what do you I'll mean by that? that. Um, okay, so when the legislature shows up, there will be um, a supplemental appropriation for when they left last time, they estimated caseloads right. through 2012, right? right? Um, and yet the caseloads didn't turn out, and the utilization and the drugs didn't turn out just like everybody thought. It ended up that more patients, more hospital visits, more drugs, and that tab, that bill, is $4.7 billion. Then, that, will, that would get us current to the start of legislative session. But then for the supplemental appropriation that would come a bit later, that's the first emergency appropriation or yeah. supplemental appropriation. But then they've got to, number one, that 4.7 would be built in because those same caseload right. estimates, number of visits, number of clients, patients, number of drugs used would fit for 2014-15 plus a small increase in the caseload. Um, but then they've also got to fill that other part that starts in roughly in March or April. So they'll do the 4.7. Um, we've asked for and are getting permission from the LBB to move some money around within the agency. Otherwise, Department of Aging and Disability Services will run out of funds in December. We'll get that opportunity and th so then the money is moved from one agency to another. That'll carry us until March. Maybe we could push it to April by delaying some payments. We don't want to do that. So let's just say that in March, we would run out of funds for the rest of that fiscal year. Now, where's that money going to come from? Rainy Day Fund or someplace else? You'd have to ask the lawmakers. Uh, is this any way to do business? Is this any way to run a state? I know the governor has said as part of his budget compact, no more accounting tricks. That's like cutting off oxygen to the legislature <laughs> if you look backwards. I mean, the reality is this, this seems like a hell of a way to do business in the state. It's like the state is held together with bailing wire and spit. Why, why do we do this? Um, Again, I'm sorry to be a broken record. You'll have to ask the lawmakers. Now, I, I will tell you. Go I back tell you, in time to when you were one. Try that. to <laughs> channel that we mindset. Not, are we for not me. out of time yet. Um, um, I think I think to do it responsibly, legislatures can do that on a on a on a an, sort of an ad hoc basis, delay a payment. But then it's important that they come back. And if you'll remember, in 2003, which was a very bad budget. 
as well. Uh, the legislature did some of those things. I was on Senate Finance. We did some of those things. And then as the budget got better by 2005, Governor Dewhurst said, okay, before y'all get all happy about the better budget scenario, I want you to remember we've got to go back and fix some of those things. So you're going to pay back forward so right. that you, that delayed payment you did by one day. Do you join, the, join the governor in saying that we should put a kibosh on these kind of accounting trips going forward? Um, I work for the governor. Policy of the governor is a policy of the commissioner? It is. Okay. He it said is. yes. Then it's, that not, it's not an unreasonable thing to ask. It's, 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 um, legislatures do what they need to do at the time to get things moving along, and I appreciate that. And um, it's a lot more complicated than it sounds. It was easy for me to sort of rail against the system before I got on House Appropriations and studied at the knee of Chairman Janelle and others. Uh, it becomes a different system, and that's why I, I think you'll see a lot less discord and amongst the different parties, when members um, are on the Appropriations Committee together or Senate Finance, it's just, you sit back and look at it and you go, okay, all the rest of that stuff is great and it's, it's, it's good and it's right in theory. We're now dealt with an X number of dollars to provide X number of services to certain citizens. We get and we've got it. waiting lists. We've got huge waiting lists for disabled patients right. in, in the state. 30,000 people on waiting lists for some disability services. Um, before I, before I, before I get the hook, you made me finish, I just want to mention two things. Number one, we should always keep in mind our friends who are suffering in the Northeast. Absolutely. I am BOI, born on the island. Um, and, it, you know, it, hurricanes can be dramatic, exciting things to watch on TV and to anticipate. But when they hit, yeah. suddenly the lights go out and you say, oh, my goodness. And, and, and there's going to be a lot more suffering uh, for a lot longer than, than, and frankly, people are paying attention to it. Yes. I agree with so that. let's remember that. That's a good, a good way to end. Dr. Jenick, thank you very much. One more, for your one more issue. All right, one, one more time. One more issue. One more issue. Hold your applause. Wait, wait a second. Um, it's easy to sit here and talk at length about Medicaid because that is a huge part of the budget and a big driver of what takes place over at the Capitol. But I just want to remind everybody we've got a mission of providing child protective services, adult protective services. We regulate child license, uh, we license child care facilities. We, we regulate nursing homes, we regulate hospitals. We've got a huge mission. That's why we've got 55,000 employees. We could do it with less employees. I think we could do it more efficiently. But I just want folks to remember the important mission, child protective services is so important. It's a law and order issue. And, and, and I don't think they would mind me saying, I get Senator Jane Nelson and Representative Donna Dukes come to me and they're on the same page on child protective services. We can do something when you put that kind of coalition together. Thanks for having me. All right, Dr. Janik, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Can you take some questions? Can you take some oh, questions? Yeah. Okay.